Hi there. Welcome to part six of Python for Biologists. Uh, today is the last in a series of six lectures in which we uh, get a little hands-on with Python and make use of uh, you know, its functions and libraries in order to read a FASTA sequence database and characterize the number of amino acid, a number of times each amino acids uh, each amino acid appears in the database. We'll also be adding some code today to evaluate the sequence lengths of the entries in the database. Um, and to do that, we're going to re we're, we're going to renovate our code in some ways. In the past weeks, we have focused on reading FASTA text files as text files. Um, pretty much every programming language out there has some sort of ability to read uh, the uh, the text files line by line into a bunch of strings and then process them. But today we're going to change that. Today we're going to make use of the BioPython library, uh, which is very handy for bioinformatics users, in order to read sequence by sequence rather than line by line as we pass through our sequence database. And because we're going to be adding some uh, numeric assessment, um, in, the, in this case about the sequence lengths, we're going to uh, introduce two different libraries for the purpose. So we're going to start with BioPython, which adds the uh, file reader capabilities, the database readers. Uh, and we're also going to introduce NumPy, which is a very widely used library for scientific computing. So why do we, why do we bother with these? Is it just that a, a particular function we want happens to be in there? I, I would say that one of the, the key reasons why we would use BioPython and NumPy is that we're really trying to streamline our code. We're trying to streamline how we go about doing our bioinformatics research. We, uh, we could write yet another FASTA file reader, um, or if we're trying to read an XML format, we could write a, an XML file reader, or if we're working with a database, we could use something that reads um, SQL, uh, SQLite databases, for example. Each of those is possible, but because these things have already been coded and hopefully put into libraries uh, that are very good for that purpose, we can save ourselves a lot of time and avoid uh, having to make changes later on in our code just because the file format's changed, when that could instead have been handled by the BioPython uh, coders. Uh, similarly, um, we would probably use NumPy because even though we could uh, rewrite Fast Fourier Transform, for example, uh, it's a whole lot simpler and, bug uh, and, and freer of bugs as well to use a numeric library that's already in existence for that purpose. It already has a lot of efficiencies that we might not think of if we were writing this code for the first time. So we would, I, I would stress that although many programmers uh, will, will say, well, I don't really like that library, so I wrote my own, I, I would ask uh, that, that all of us think about whether that's really useful or not, uh, because very frequently simply reusing an, a, a library that somebody else has already created is going to give us a, and, and our users a, a lot fewer bugs to deal with. All right, so BioPython is the first of these tools that I wanted to talk about. Um, I, we, we may think of Python as a, a, a young, new language, and BioPython as, as young and new, but in fact, it was published in Bioinformatics a decade ago, uh, as you can see at that uh, in the citation at the bottom of the screen there. Um, if you have not installed BioPython already, you're going to need, again, to make use of pip to install it. Down at the bottom of the screen there, you can see python-m pip install-u biopython will update your biopython to the latest edition. Now, I, I mention that in part because it could seem that if you're trying to install biopython, the thing you need to install is the bio uh, library. And in fact, that's not correct. In this case, biopython is what you want. Um, and it's the thing that includes all of these little functions I'm mentioning on screen. The one that's of interest to us today is Seek.io. That's the very first uh, bullet point there. Um, I mentioned that we wanted to read a FASTA database in this case. As a result, we could just stick with our text uh, line reader, as I, as I said. But what if somebody wanted to evaluate the sequences in another kind of database, not, not one that was in an easy-to-parse FASTA text file? In that case, Seek.io, having used it to read uh, the FASTA databases in the first place, gives you a very easy ability to read other types of file formats that the user might specify. So that's really powerful. Although similarly, you can write files pretty easily with Seek.io too. Okay, uh, now pairwise aligner 
I mentioned largely because a lot of people think of bioinformatics as the art of aligning sequences. Now, clearly, bioinformatics is bigger than that, but um, certainly doing things like evaluating the extent to which two sequences are similar to each other is a very, very common task for bioinformatics. So if you need to perform a Smith-Waterman alignment of a couple sequences, pairwise aligner will handle that for you. Um, it, that, that's for sequence pairs. Of course, sometimes you have a whole host of sequences you want to compare. What if you're looking at a protein that you believe to be orthologous uh, that, that is shared among many species? In a case like that, uh, maybe you're looking at pyruvate kinase. It's an enzyme that's in, responsible in part for glycolysis. So if you were to grab the pyruvate kinase sequence for a yeast and for a human and for an archaea and for a, you know, any, any number of other species, they, plenty of them have it, um, then you might attempt to do a multiple sequence alignment. And that is, capa that, that is a capability that BioPython brings to our code uh, through the bio align set of, of functions. So that's really powerful. Now it's it's not just the case that sequences are everything in BioPython. Uh, we also have the ability to read protein structure data. So if you have a protein data bank structure, uh, maybe you have the four character accession number for a particular structure you want to visualize, a bio PDB is a set of libraries to help you read and and, and work with those sorts of data. That's very powerful. The PDB format is pretty simple to understand. It's just a big text file again, um, but it has a lot of complex pieces to it. And so people who've, uh, who have uh, previously worked with those have incorporated a, a rather full-featured reader for PDB within BioPython. That's really powerful. So just because you use BioPython in this case for SeqIO does not limit you from using it from all of those other uh, possible avenues of, of work. So BioPython is, is a very powerful feature, uh, feature set for uh, people working in bioinformatics. Okay, so uh, in the past, we opened the file using the Python open uh, com uh, function. Uh, here, we're going to use a parse method within SeqIO, which is part of BioPython. Uh, so that's quite powerful, uh, but parse might be an unfamiliar word. Uh, so I want to try to explain what this means. Parsing is something that computer scientists are doing pretty much all the time. Um, and the, the, uh, the value of, the parse, uh, of parsing is that from a string of, of uh, text, you can infer some sort of meaning from it. In this case, when we run parse on a FASTA database, instead of saying this is a line from the file, this is another line from a file, this is another line from the file, the seekio.parse method is instead going to, uh, to recognize that the FASTA sequence database is not just a list of lines, it is a list of sequences. So by instead of, it, it, by, by using the seekio parse command, we are going to have one, uh, a, another sequence corresponding to each batch of lines in the FASTA file. If we read it as a text file, each line would be handled separately. But seekio parse is going to be able to read each protein at a time or each uh, nucleotide sequence at a time. Uh, you can see in this case that we have to give it a file name. In this case, I've given it thing.fasta. And we need to specify the format type. As I mentioned, you can read multiple formats from this. So we have to specify that it's a FASTA file that it's going to read. And then underneath that, we can have the same try and accept structure that we had uh, that we introduced last week. So instead of parsing through the FASTA file as a bunch of lines, we're going to parse through the FASTA file as a series of sequence records. That means that for each sequence record, we no longer have to check whether the first character is a, a greater than symbol. We know that if we have a sequence record, we have another accession. So we can go ahead to increase the accession count by one. And when we want to ask how many times each amino acid is used, we can update letter counts um, remember that is from collections, it's a counter object. We can update it with the entire sequence in one go because we see that the sequence record has this subfield called seq, that is the, the text sequence of that protein or uh, an oligonucleotide for that matter. Okay, so that's, this is uh, a little bit different. Instead of going line by line, we're going to go protein by protein through the database. And that prevents us from having to do as much 
uh, if ifing and, and so on to, to try to figure out what which of these two uh, which of these two capabilities we want to do in a given line because we're not going line by line. And of course, we still have the possibility of generating exceptions. So at the bottom, we check to see if we've generated a file not found error by trying to zip through all of the uh, entries in the FASTA database. If so, we're going to report it and quit. Now, NumPy uh, is, is playing a, a very familiar role for this software. NumPy is ubiquitous, and, and frequently, when you uh, load a, a different library into memory, or, or install it for that matter, NumPy comes along for the ride. So things like matplotlib will uh, frequently make use of, of NumPy. And if you haven't got the software already installed in its own accord, uh, it will install it, install it for you. Now, one of the great values that NumPy gives us is the ability to work with n-dimensional arrays. We have talked about uh, arrays kind of casually, but I've, I've more or less given you the impression that arrays are the same thing as lists, and that's not really true. Remember that a list is a, uh, a, a set of items. Uh, maybe you specified it to be equal to 2, 3, 5, for example. So you might start with the list having that value being initialized with three values in it, but you could then add the next prime number to add a 7 to it. So in a sense, a list is a dynamic uh, collection of objects. An, end, an array is not a dimension, uh, is not a, uh, uh, an object that you change the, shi change the size of on the fly like that. An array is designed to be a fixed number of columns or a fixed number of columns and, and rows, or in the case of an n-dimensional array, you can, you can go above two dimensions. You're not limited to uh, work with 1D arrays, which are just series of numbers, or 2D arrays, which are matrices, uh, you, can, you can actually go to a third dimension. Um, so if you can imagine that you were trying to catalog all the students in your class, you might start with a, uh, a, simple, uh, a simple variable like, what province did you come from? So South Africa has nine provinces, so you might have uh, nine, different, uh, nine different columns that each represent whether uh, if somebody is from uh, the Western Cape, then we're going to add one to the Western Cape uh, uh, column within that. But next, you might decide that you also want to record uh, the the sexes of the of the students. So you might uh, put a uh, add a one to uh, the uh, the male or the female column uh, uh, in in an array like that. And you might even get further. You go further than that. You might want to say, well, I want to catalog. Um, the ages of everyone. So if the student that you're adding to this collection is, uh, say, age 19, you can add one to that column. If they're 22, you can add one to that column. Or, and maybe they're a, a returning student, so maybe they're 40 or 50 for that matter. Okay, but if you want to put all of that together, you can imagine that we've got a three-dimensional space. We have the province of origin on one column, we have the uh, sex on another column, and we have the age on yet a third column. So the distribution of all of the students will then add one column at a particular coordinate in that three-dimensional space. So that is an example of an n-dimensional array structure. One of the things that NumPy makes feasible through n-dimensional arrays is the ability to broadcast an arithmetic operation such uh, that you're combining information from arrays of different shapes. Now, I think that, that, uh, that concept is not easily understandable without an example, so we're going to include one in the next slide. Of course, being able to store data is great, but being able to compute on it is even better. NumPy has a huge number of, of function calls and, and uh, internal libraries to help us do very, very complex operations. If you've never uh, made use of Fast Fourier Transform, um, I would pretty much assure you that it's been used on your behalf for you. So Fast Fourier Transform is very, very useful when you're trying to understand a set of uh, frequencies in a, uh, in a, a, a large uh, array of data. So Fast Fourier Transform is uh, very powerful, and yet it's rather complex to try to write one yourself. The good news is that NumPy already has a function for you that can make uh, the use of this, this complex operation very, easy, very easily done. Now, the other reason why you might want to use NumPy is that you're trying to do scientific computing in another library. 
you may be completely unaware that NumPy is running in the background in order to support uh, the use of a, a scientific computing library that you're making use of. So uh, NumPy is a, is, is a sneaky program. It ends up in a lot of places. We, we've already played with it in a way through matplotlib. And finally, I would point to this uh, paper down at the bottom. Again, this is not a, a new library. It was published uh, in this case. Well, this, this article anyway was from eight years ago. Um, it, it, this article is from Stefan van der Valt uh, at uh, Stellenbosch University. So people locally uh, are, are working with this library and extending its capabilities and writing about it in, in, public, in published articles. So I uh, certainly uh, NumPy has a real presence in the scientific computing community. All right, now I said that I was going to give us a broadcasting example. Uh, remember that NumPy is, a, is a, uh, a separately installable library, so we need to import it as a first step. So having imported NumPy, we are able to create two new variables. Now I've created, I've just used the very unimaginative names A and B. Uh, and you'll note that I'm, I'm not just uh, saying A equals and then a bunch of square brackets, etc. Instead, I'm running the constructor. We're specifically creating an n-dimensional array uh, using the constructor within NumPy, so numpy.array. I want to point out another weird thing about this call. You see that I have two square brackets here? Well, th this round bracket is here just because it's constructor function and the, uh, the, uh, and all functions have, uh, cur uh, have round uh, parentheses on them. But I, I know that you've seen plenty of cases like this where you had a square bracketed set of numbers. That's a list, isn't it? Um, but here we have two square brackets at the start and two square brackets at the end. That's because what we're creating is a list of lists. Ah, yes, you can, you can really mess with people's minds in Python, and here we've done it. So we have a list containing 000, a list containing 101010, 10, 10, and another list containing 202020, 20, 20, and we've combined them all into one list of lists that is passed to NumPy array. Might seem a little counterintuitive, but I would point out that down here, when we print the value of A, we see that that's been retained, that we still have 000, 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20. And because we're printing it, NumPy arrays recognize that these lists of lists are actually n-dimensional arrays. Now, uh, as we go below that, we can print the other array we created. Now, that one was much simpler, 1, 2, 3. So a single list is passed to NumPy array, and that produces a one-dimensional array. So when we print a plus B, we tell NumPy to perform the broadcasting event. And this broadcasting event says, we want to add 1, 2, 3 to all of A, but there aren't enough values to do that. You know, if, if B were also a two-dimensional array like A, we could uh, that were both 3 by 3, we could just add them together. That'd be straightforward. But in this case, we have a 1D array that we want to add to a 2D array. And you can see that the effect is that 1, 2, 3 will be added to each row. 1, 2, 3 represents 0 plus 1, 0 plus 2, and 0 plus 3. 11, 12, 13 is equal to 10 plus 1, 10 plus 2, and 10 plus 3. So this is a, a fairly trivial example. You could probably figure out a way to do this without a whole lot of hassle, even if you didn't have NumPy available. But this, this concept is applicable to a whole host of mathematical operations, and that's a, that's a very powerful capability. If you don't mind, I think that it might be valuable for us to go through a little example of this. So I'm going to move to the directory that contains my, my code. Here I've got a very clean one. I have just a, today's code in there. Um, and I'm going to start the Python interpreter. Now, if we uh, look at the file that you've already downloaded from the server, uh, you see that uh, we had uh, the, the date of the 15th associated with tinkering. So tinkering is the example that we want to use. We're going to use a little bit of visualization, and we're going to use a little bit of uh, NumPy's uh, n-dimensional array work. So we need to import both of those libraries. So if I type import NumPy and import matplotlib, pyplot, we're good. Those are both in place. So let us uh, simply run the code that appears on that slide. And I'm going to paste that in. OK, so we can see that the value of A, the value of B, and the value of A plus B 
are all reported as arrays. You can see that up above, when we printed it, we see the same value as this list of lists. And, and one of the obvious questions that may come to mind for you is, how did this NumPy array constructor make any difference whatsoever? So I'm going to, I'm going to set up another set of, uh, of arrays. Oh, sorry, this time not using the NumPy array constructor, but just using everything that we passed to it. So you see that I'm not using NumPy array or the parentheses, I'm just using the square bracket section. So if I set up a value for D, do we get a different value when we print D? Well, we do, don't we? We see that when we printed A up above, which was created using NumPy array, it's printed in three rows. It recognizes that this is a two-dimensional array. When we print D, which was handed the same values, but not within the NumPy array constructor, D just knows that it's a list of lists. It doesn't know that the tens should appear below the zeros and the twenties should appear below the tens. Similarly, what we get back are different types. So if I say type A, it recognizes that this was a NumPy created data structure called an ND array. That's an n-dimensional array. And although D was handed the same information to create it, because it came from a list of list constructor, it only recognizes that it is a list. We could similarly dig into these structures a little bit more. Remember that you can ask for, say, the first item of D by saying D0 or D1 for the second item or D2 for the third item. So we should note that if you take the type of D0, it's still a list. So you can see that D on the outside is a list of lists. And when you look inside one of these smaller pieces, the, the square bracketed sections within, this itself is a list. This itself is a list. But when we ran with the NumPy constructor instead, when we used uh, the type of A, we saw that it was an ND array, an n-dimensional array. Okay, so I think that's, that's a valuable uh, place to start with these. They, they might look like lists of lists, but that's just a way to pass that information to the constructor and get an n-dimensional array. Now I want to uh, return to this code. Before we pass away from NumPy, I wanted to point out that there's a lot of mathematical capability packed in there. And we have an additional feature within PyPlot that I wanted to show you that we didn't cover last week. So here, we will start by creating um, new variables, normal and uniform. I'm going to just copy that text over for now. So normal now has 10 values in it. We can see that normal is, uh, is not a list. We can say, what is the type of normal again? And we see that in this case, we've used the normal function built into the random library of NumPy to create a list of size 10 that is stored as a NumPy n-dimensional array. It's its favorite format. So it's, it's reasonable to expect that if you execute a, a NumPy command that returns a series of numbers, it'll come back as, a, as an n-dimensional array. So in this case, we see that we have 10 numbers. I would also note that we've used a different call to build our normal and uniform uh, uh, variables. So if I say uniform, I, I run that. Now, if you're running along at home on, on the same code, you should recognize that your, your call to normal and your call to uniform have resulted in different numbers. We can pretty much guarantee that because the, the random normal and random uniform functions are designed to give us a, a sampling of a distribution, a random sampling from a distribution. In the first case, we have grabbed numbers from a normal distribution or a bell-shaped or Gaussian curve. In the bottom case, we've called on a uniform distribution where there's, uh, if you were uh, working from, for example, the number zero to the number one, any number in that space is equally probable to come out. Um, that's different than a normal, isn't it? Because in a normal uh, distribution, you would expect most of the values you grab out to be relatively close to the medium value. I would note that these have different default functions. I believe in the case of the normal distribution, 
the the um, the mean for that distribution is set to zero, and the standard deviation is set to one. Uh, but in the uniform distribution, I believe the defaults are 0 and 1, a range in this case of 0 to 1. Okay, so we have now grabbed these numbers. I, I want to make a, a quick illustration, if I can, of a statistical principle using this, which is to say that if you have a relatively small sampling from a distribution, it's rather hard to tell what distribution it comes from. So in this case, We've generated a, a, we've sampled 10 values from a normal distribution and 10 values from a uniform distribution. I want to ask, do they look normal or do they look uniform? We will leave aside performing a statistical test for that purpose. So I'm going to run the histogram function within PyPlot in order to visualize the data from the normal distribution and from the uniform distribution. All right, so if I just paste that in here, these are the data that we retrieved from the normal distribution. So I ask you, does that look bell-shaped? And you might say, well, the highest value is sort of near the middle, but I would also point out there are some very high values down below. This doesn't look very bell-shaped to me. So I'm going to close this plot. Now, in the next case, we told the software we wanted 10 values drawn randomly and uniformly between 0 and 1. And you could say, well, uh, it's mostly kind of flattish, but then there are these regions, like right around 0.4 here and right down here below 0.2, that didn't really get occupied by any values. So if you were to look at the two plots we had there, uh, the normal and the uniform, neither of those is going to give you a clear distinction to say, oh yes, those data are clearly from a normal distribution, or these data are clearly from a uniform distribution. One way to think about that is that even if you uh, are working with a, uh, a an experiment that produces a normally distributed output, if you're doing three replicates versus three replicates, your ability to determine empirically that those values are normal is essentially nil. So let's let's try changing the code now. Let's say instead of collecting just ten values, we instead collect a hundred values. Do we do the normal and uniform variables? now look like they're normally distributed and uniformly distributed? Or are they still just very noisy and hard to discern? OK, so we're going to rerun that code. And now we have a different distribution that's come back for our normal distribution. We see that uh, we have a big glom in the middle. And that's a good sign. Having sampled 100 values from the normal distribution, we have something that looks like it has some sort of central tendency. That said, uh, every uh, every normal distribution should have just one mode. Uh, and, and once you hit that mode, you should just keep falling until you get all the way to infinity. But here we see that we have this big valley between two modes, basically. Um, so that's, that's not a very normal looking distribution just yet. How about our uniform distribution? We've now collected 100 numbers that uh, run uniformly from 0 to 1. But is this a really flat profile? Eh, not quite yet. Not quite yet. So. I, I want to su submit that even if you have 100 values, it's still difficult to tell what distribution they come from. And now for this last stage of our little experiment, we're going to sample 1,000 values from the normal distribution and 1,000 values from the uniform distribution. You note that the computer doesn't have any pause when we run this code. It is immediately able to generate those random numbers and uh, in an eye blink. Computers have gotten a lot faster since I started programming. OK, so now our normal distribution has one peak in the middle, and it keeps falling all the way to the right and keeps falling all the way to the left. This is more like what a, a normal distribution should look like. So we, we can feel some comfort that when we've sampled 1,000 values from a distribution, our ability to tell whether it's normal or not has gotten a lot better. Now, it, has our uniform distribution gotten better? Certainly, certainly. We have a small amount of variation here from the highest value to the lowest. But our range is, is pretty, pretty small. And that's what you expect in the values that you see across the bins of a, of a uniform distribution. So that's a, a simple example of the kind of, of quick mathematical simulation you can do within Python, uh, coupled with the visualization to make, uh, to make those, uh, those differences apparent to a user. All right, now let us come back to, oh, our slides are over here. There we go. Um, now we've, we've done a little playing around with NumPy, and that was really powerful. I want to return us to one of the slides that we started with 
at the very beginning of this course. Remember that we had uh, these magenta, um, sorry, the, these magenta round boxes to represent starting and stopping points. We had one way to start the software. If the user didn't provide enough information, we needed to terminate uh, and tell them how to use the software by providing a usage line. If the FASTA database uh, that they provided us is not readable, we have to report an error and kick out. But if the FASTA, if they did provide a FASTA database and it's and it was legible, we were able to read the next entry and the next entry and the next entry to update our statistics at each step. And at the very end, we could have our report and terminate. I would point out that all of those pieces of functionality were already in a, in place last week, but. Uh, as we look at the changes that we've made in our code, we're going to see that an awful lot of it has been shifted uh, and, and added to in the last week by the addition of NumPy functionality for us to do some characterization of sequence lengths and by the addition of BioPython to parse the FASTA file into sequences for us. All right, so let us uh, now look at the source code for goal six. That should be one that you downloaded uh, uh, as part of the, today's lesson. Remember that we had a series of, well, we, here we have five different libraries that we're all importing uh, to make use of the code this time around. Remember that sys was necessary because we made use of the arguments passed to the software by the command line. Collections was necessary because we used the counter object to represent how many times each amino acid had been used. The pie plot one, I think, is quite apparent. We're making plots of the, the data that come out. Now we import NumPy because we're going to be doing some mathematical operations on sequence lengths. And in the case of BioPython, I'm grabbing just a subpart of that library. Here I'm importing the seek.io library from the BioPython. Remember that I said you should install BioPython to get that capability. Internally to the code, though, it gets named bio. All right, so we are now looking at version six. This is the final version of the FASTA sniffer. This is, of course, the code to grab the, the FASTA file name from the, from the command line. These are, this is the section that kicks out if they did not provide us a FASTA file name. All right, here we have the code that kicks out if we uh, fail to read the file that they provided. But this is the new part right here. We can see that we are using seek.io parse in order to pass the file name provided by the user to the, the, uh, the, the BioPython reader, the seek.io section. And that's going to parse it into different protein objects. We initialize our counts. We initialize a new variable called sequence lengths because this is where we're going to store every protein length in the database. So the list is going to start out entry, uh, start out empty, and every time we hit a new sequence record, every time we hit a new protein sequence, we're going to ask how long was that sequence? So sequence record is iterating through the FASTA file. And the sequence field within it is going to be the string representing the full sequence. I want to point out a really big advantage that we picked up by using BioPython. If we were looking at each line of sequence individually, as we processed through the um, as we processed through the lines for each entry uh, every, for each protein in that sequence database, we would only be able to tell how long this line is, not how long all of the lines are that contribute to the sequence of an individual protein. Because remember, the sequence for one protein is likely to be split over multiple lines in a FASTA database. So every time we get another sequence out, we're going to compute its length using the len function. And then we will append that length to our sequence lengths. Sequence length starts out empty, but then we're going to add another length every time we find another protein sequence. All right. So at the bottom, we've added some new reporting code. Uh, this part is the same as last week because we're computing the, uh, the frequent, uh, sorry, the <laughs> we're computing uh, uh, resorting the, the counts of how many times each amino acid appears from most common to least common. That's the freak dict. And then we alpha, uh, alphabetize the amino acids uh, so that we can show those counts uh, amino acid by amino acid. That's alpha dict. 
So at the end, we're reporting four kinds of information, really. We have how many different accessions are in the database. We have two plots to show us the amino acid frequencies sorted first by frequency and then by the alphabet. And now we've added a fourth type of reporting to this code. We're going to give a distributional characterization of the sequence lengths. The sequence lengths themselves are just a really, really long list of numbers. So we want to characterize that in some way. It's not very useful to the user if we hand them back a list of 4,000 numbers and say, deduce what you want from that. That's not very good. So instead, we're going to use a number of functions from NumPy that can help us to characterize this. Uh, so I think the first value uh, that we're going to compute is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, so the NumPy.mean computes the arithmetic mean of, this, in this case, the sequence lengths. So it's going to add together all 4,000 sequence lengths and divide by 4,000 whatever it is. And because the number that comes back from a mean is a floating point number, we're going to apply the round function to it. You can see that it's rounding comma 1. So we're going to uh, round that value uh, uh, to the nearest tenth uh, of a value. So that, again, is uh, producing a floating point number. We are going to change that into a string because we're going to stick it all onto one big string saying the mean of sequence lengths is da da da. Okay, so the average is really nice. And the, the, frequently we think of the mean as telling us everything we need to know about a, a bunch of numbers. That, of course, is not true. I would point out that the mean of the normal distribution that we sampled from earlier was zero and that the mean of the uniform distribution was 0.5. But how they're shaped is quite different, isn't it? So we're going to compute what's called a, a, a sometimes called a, a five-value summary of the distribution. A couple of those values are, uh, are, are pretty straightforward, the minimum and the maximum. Now, NumPy calls this the A min, and this one is the A max. I would kind of joke that NumPy is telling a little prayer here. But uh, in this case, the minimum and maximum values are going to tell us the shortest and the longest sequence length that are in there. That's the range, after all. But the range is not all the information we would like. So we're also going to compute quartiles, in effect. We're going to ask, what is the 25th percentile of the, of the values, the one that falls one quarter of the way through the list of numbers if we sorted them from smallest to largest? We have a median value, which is the middle of that list. And we have the 75th percentile, that represents if you were three quarters of the way through that list. So these five numbers are this five value uh, summary of the distribution, plus we're going to give the mean because that's something lots of people want to know. And at the end of the day, we will use the histogram method to turn that list of 4,000 numbers into a basically a frequency. It's going to cut them up into bins and do a histogram visualization. All right. So uh, we want to execute this code, but again, I'm sitting inside the interpreter at the moment, and I need to get out because I'm going to run the script from the command line. So I can take quick directory. I see that goal six is right here, and this is my uh, FASTA file itself. So I'm going to run Python, passing it the name of the script I want to run uh, on the outside. I typed up through the G and then hit tab to autocomplete. And finally, I'm going to provide the name of the sequence database itself. So Python is the, the to start the Python interpreter using this script on that input file. I run the code, and in no time flat, I've got a, a really good characterization of my sequence database. You remember that we first reported how many entries there were, 4,018. And now we've got this handy graph to show us what amino acid was most frequent and least frequent in the sequence database. I can close that out, and in no time flat, it's able to show me the alpha dict structure, which is to say the alphabetical dictionary that's been built out of the counter. In this case, uh, we see that the most common amino acid and the least common amino acid are right next to each other, which is a little jarring, isn't it? Um, but it's very useful to have the data sorted in this way in case you were trying to figure out how many times a given letter appeared. If, for example, you wanted to know, uh, does this sequence database contain any X's, that would appear down here. That's kind of a useful thing to know because some sequence databases contain more than just the 20 amino acids that appear here. 
And then finally, we get down to our new numeric assessment of the sequence lengths. So in this case, we have the mean of the sequence lengths as 333. We have a minimum number of, of uh, amino acids in the sequences as 27. So one protein in here at least had a sequence that contained only 27 amino acids. Just think if you uh, created this database and said, I want to see nothing less than 100. Stuff like that would have just fallen right out. We see that uh, our five value, uh, our range runs all the way up to past 4,000 amino acids in a single protein. But most of the data are, sort, are at a much lower range of values. We see that there's some number of entries that have 1,000 amino acids. But more than 3 quarters of our sequence databases uh, of, of, the, of, the of the sequences in this database are accounted for by um, going up to 420 amino acids. So that's, that's pretty shocking. Um, we see that this, this maximum number of amino acids in one protein is way above the norm for this database. And we might, if we're really curious, try to dig through the sequence database and report it. Now that you've uh, learned enough Python code to get this far, I suspect you can uh, work out a way to show what is the longest sequence drawn from the database and what is the shortest sequence drawn from the database. I, I hope you'll uh, take up that challenge and try coding it up. Um, but from here, we are at the end of the programming lessons. So with, uh, with six weeks under our belt, I hope that you've uh, had a lot of fun learning how Python works and that you understand a little better what kinds of challenges programmers think through as they attempt to, uh, to create powerful, capable, robust source code. Um, along the way, we didn't talk a whole lot about things like putting comments in your code and uh, working with source repositories and so on. There's a, a world of interesting topics that we could possibly discuss, but um, for a, a first start in programming, I'm really proud of you for making it all the way through these six lessons. Thank you so much.